Well, thank you all very much for coming to, um, to listen to this talk, um, which is a truly integrated talk between um, Dr. Richards, who's one of the GPs here, I'm sure, I don't know if any of you know that, and, um, uh, and Liz, who is one of our acupuncturists. Um, and they're going to be giving you two perceptions on um, pain, acute pain and chronic pain. Um, so take it away, Dr. Richards. <laughs> Okay, hello, so that's um, Dr. Richards. So this is a talk about uh, pain, it's an integrated talk between myself and uh, Liz, um, uh, acupuncturist and uh, Chinese herbal sort of medicine therapist. So first of all, obviously, <coughs> what is pain? Um, how do people manage their pain? Um, big question, it's part of being human, pain, pain and suffering, and it's got a lot of representation in you know, art and literature and music. And uh, um, so I put up a uh, something called a black box of pain, which I invented. And it's interesting because at the moment, there's nothing in it. But that's a talking point as well. Um, so a bit of a background about pain. And the, um, obviously, pain's talked about in the history of man for a, a, a you know, thousands of years and to try to overcome it and um, Descartes who's a philosopher in the 17th century uh, thought about pain and with links to both theological and the physical foundations and not in the sense of sort of physical as in the science of physics that we think of now but physical as in the physical being um, that he developed this sort of concept of mind-body dualism so he thought that um, pain um, was part of the sort of body and sort of separate from mind um, and he also thought that sort of uh, you know the mind could live separately from the body but the body couldn't live separately from the mind um, so there were these links to both sort of theology and uh, uh, the physical nature of being uh, and he talked and described pain uh, and this is sort of before they decided to, or they, they worked out, uh, there were such things as neurons, and there's this uh, uh, picture that um, represents particles of pain from, or heat from uh, a fire, travelling up a thread, which then switched on a valve, which then caused muscular changes, which caused a withdrawal response. So this is in uh, a piece of work called The Treaties of Man, which was uh, written in 1664 and this is the basis of pain uh, and medicine and how we manage pain now um, but as we can see from sort of anatomy actually both the mind and body sort of are connected through the spinal cord and nerves to the to the skin in this case and this is the spinal cord going up into the brain so this is a representation um, and looking at a bit more of a definition of what actually pain is and this is a fairly sort of agreed definition of pain uh, which was developed in 1994 and it's an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage so this has been fairly consistently uh, referenced so what why do we have pain um, interestingly sort of um, or what is pain for and you know uh, why does it, it, it exist so um, you know pain can be acute uh, or chronic and there's a time difference between the two and acute pain is a normal response um, and it is protective and if we go back to my black box of pain there was nothing in here um, which was interesting because actually having no pain sensation there are problems with that. You can get ill from having no pain. People who have diabetes and nerve damage can get injuries from not being able to detect uh, sort of nails going into feet that they stand on and get infected. Um, and people with things like leprosy, they have a lack of sensation of pain due to the infection affecting the nerves and they can start losing parts of their body. Um, so actually having pain is important, actually, it's protective. Um, and if you go back to that image, uh, the Descartes sort of described as a reflex response. So you put your hand in a fire, you withdraw it. So that's once again a response to some stimulus that's uh, 
that's considered harmful. And obviously, it can be a sign of disease. So you can, you know, you fracture your ankle. You know, it's actually um, uh, sort of your body's showing you that there is a problem there. But then when it turns into chronic problems, and this is now becoming an abnormal response, uh, because actually we, the theories are that it's actually extending beyond the expected sort of period of healing. So we know from medicine that you know, things heal up, um, but chronic pain is a pain that's starting to become abnormal, and therefore it's not protective, uh, and therefore unhelpful, um, unlike acute pain. So definitions of acute versus chronic pain, less than a month acute pain. Uh, chronic definitions vary three to six months, but usually about three months or longer is considered abnormal. And in between, we, medically, we use the term subacute. So there are different types of pain, um, and there's the typical painful sensations that we get from you know, temperature changes or uh, physical changes or chemical changes through inflammation, for example. Uh, nerves can get pain themselves, and that's called neuropathic pain, either due to direct damage to the nerve structure itself or uh, due to um, nerves that have nerves as well. Um, also psychological pain. So going back to the definition of, uh, the, um, of pain, it does include an emotional element, and the brain is an organ the same as other parts of our body, uh, and therefore when it is distressed, it is in, it's through emotion, and that's emotional pain. When things start to go wrong with sort of nerves, you can get other unusual sort of changes, such as sort of normal uh, sensations, such as a sheet on a bed, um, maybe sort of going over your feet, can become very painful. Um, it's unclear why this happens, but this is a known feature, and also very typical of what we call diabetic neuropathy. Um, so, and which obviously can be quite distressing. Uh, also, you can get hyperalgesia, which is an increased sensitivity of pain. We'll come on to that, how that works sort of later. So, and there are these more complex conditions, which you've probably heard about, things like phantom limb pain, um, because our brain has representations of our body uh, in something called a homunculus in our brain, which sort of represents and maps to other parts of our body. So when the nerves are, and or the organ or the limb is missing, um, the brain doesn't know that it's not there and can stimulate pain as well. There's also something called complex regional pain syndrome or re uh, reflex, actually, that should be reflex sympathetic dystrophy. Um, and they're sort of interchangeable terms for the same things. These two conditions are very complicated and not clear why they happen. So we need to sort of talk, talk a bit about pain because actually it helps in the management of pain and this, the background of where pain comes from is really important and looking at the science behind it because it will influence how you think about pain and what we do about it. Um, so if we look at sort of nerve anatomy, there are two different types of nerve fibres and there are sort of something called the um, a, um, a delta nerve fibres which are the initial response to pain which are really very fast and sharp and hurts and there's a, what we call C nerve fibres and they sort of, uh, their impulses run much more slowly and become much more sort of pulsatile, deep, throbbing pain uh, but also other unusual ones such as cramp and itch and burning. So what we know about chronic pain, there are a list, and this is, such a, this is a short list, really, of actually sort of uh, conditions that are associated with sort of chronic pain. Um, and, uh, you know, picking out very common things like arthritis, low back pain, neuropathic pain, irritable bowel syndrome, headaches, multiple sclerosis, depression, fibromyalgia, cancer, and some other chronic conditions I've mentioned already. Um, so looking at the, um, the reasons why pain is important, if we look at how much chronic pain there is out there, this is a public health issue really, because actually the prevalence of it is about sort of you know, almost 20%, and this is in uh, Europe, have moderate or severe chronic pain. So one in five people have chronic pain. Um, and given an example, back pain, 45 million working days a year are lost um, in work sort of due to back pain 
Um, you can get other figures for other conditions sort of on, online uh, through other research. And it has a big impact, not just on financially, but you know, on relationships, employment, sleep, um, and increased risk of suicide. Um, complications include drug dependency, and there's obviously side effects from the drugs that people use, as well as sort of effects on mental health and ultimately death through things like increased risk of suicide and also using medication. So for example, in America, there's such a high rate of prescribing opioids that there is a, um, an increased risk of death through the prescribing of opioids. And as prescribing of opioids has increased, the death rate has increased. It's not clear why that is, but there is a direct link there due to opioid prescribing itself. Um, so we know that um, chronic pain, it's difficult to manage, and there are some reasons why that is, because people with chronic pain have persistent changes in their brain um, that um, you know, are difficult to reverse, um, which is uh, important to bear in mind. Uh, also, nerves, if we go back to those C fibres, uh, C nerve fibres, um, there's something, a concept called pain wind-up. So if a, if a nerve is being stimulated constantly and repeatedly over a long period of time, then uh, it, it can then respond uh, to a lower threshold to actually stimulate that nerve pain. Um, so, you know, sort of, um, um, which, is a, which is a problem. Um, and also, the problem is that actually both pain and non-pain nerve fibres can then get into this habit of just st uh, causing a sensation of pain at very low levels of sort of stimulus. Um, there is a link between chronic pain and stress. Uh, if we look at fibromyalgia, there are concepts that sort of... Uh, chronic stressors cause sort of brain changes in the grey matter um, which um, cause chronic pain and likewise sort of stress and they feed back each other. Um, go back to the complications of pain, people who have chronic pain have an increased risk of depression and anxiety by you know, about 10 times and also through cardiovascular death and all causes of death there is a higher risk of that. That's also unclear why chronic pain causes this. It's thought to be possibly due to stressors and cortisol levels being high, which can then cause problems in the, in the sort of um, arteries, for example. So how can we modify pain? So one of those images here is actually of a kid who's sort of fallen over and sort of, you know, grazed their knee. What do people do? Kids fall over, graze their knee. What, what do, when you were younger, what did your parents do? Hmm? Yeah, rub it better. So, you know, stimulating other nerves, sort of vibration, actually sort of can modify pain, all right? Although obviously in those, in those situations as well, there's actually much more than that. There's obviously that bonding with the parent and et cetera. So these, you know, research into things like sort of chronic pain is actually quite sort of, can be quite difficult because there can be other lots of influencing factors. But um, so looking at that sort of back in 1960, Five, um, uh, a group of people called uh, Malzek and Wall uh, developed this concept of something called a gate theory, um, and that nerves can be sw uh, switched on and off um, to either sort of stimulate or stop pain signals being sent to the brain. Um, and as we know now, there are other ways that things can be sort of um, used to modify uh, these pain signals. And there's endorphins, so opioids, morphine, poppies, um, um, papaver somniferum. Um, so they, they've been used for thousands of years. And I think just thinking back that, you know, Egyptians have been using it. And I think even going back to probably Neolithic times, I think there's been some evidence to say people have been using sort of uh, plants for a long time to treat various ailments. Um, and likewise, cannabis being sort of a... Um, a, a current uh, treatment um, and it's only recently been found that sort of there are uh, uh, an, there is an internal 
endocannabinoid, so endo meaning inside, so the body's own way of, uh, of sort of producing its own cannabis-like products as well as um, or, uh, morphine-like or opioid-based products to modify the way pain signals are sent. So obviously there's a lot of research into, into all this. Um, so we've got a whole list of sort of therapeutic sort of options that are here. And um, one of the sort of uh, things to sort of potentially sort of look at is actually things like sort of active engagement and pain, and, and pain management sort of courses. So actually knowing about sort of pain and what it means and what type of pain you have and actually not letting it um, control your behaviours and the fear of pain um, prevent you from actually carrying out sort of things that you sort of need to do because actually we know that these things are really important that um, uh, you know exercise and activities and actually taking part in activities and you know doing all the things we all need to do shopping and things like that actually is very helpful but there's lots of resources here as well as there's you know, obviously classically we've got to talk about medications and sort of operative sort of interventions as well but not to you know to sort of forget about things like exercise as I've already mentioned so some more sort of therapies here and um, you'll hear a talk later or uh, tomorrow uh, on placebo uh, as being a topical um, uh, topic uh, currently which Dr. Marsha Andrews is going to be talking about um, as it does have a, a foundation in, in science and medicine uh, which we'll go through tomorrow. Um, so I thought I'd pick out a few bits of evidence because um, uh, it's you know, there is a lot of evidence about, uh, out there about a lot of the um, things we've sort of talked about and what works and what doesn't work. Uh, but I've picked out a few sort of interesting sort of things. So Tai Chi, uh, if you look at what's out there, a lot of research that it has an impact on so many different things. But, you know, I've picked out with a couple of sort of reference sort of studies there that it has an impact on low back pain, arthritis, insomnia blood pressure and even dementia and reversing sort of changes in dementia. Um, there's also um, the evidence for exercise. Uh, you only need sort of basically to, to, to inform somebody, um, so sort of two people to, to, to exercise to actually have a benefit in one person. So it has such a, a big impact on health benefits. It has the most, so the highest impact of health benefits than any of the treatments that we we talk about, you know, forgetting about pills, um, and there's uh, this has been sort of um, uh, demonstrated by a Cochrane study. Cochrane study is a big uh, sort of um, research uh, model whereby they look at a lot of studies together. They pool all the data. They uh, sort of um, uh, clean out the sort of data and the research, um, and um, uh, so therefore you can effectively get a bigger study. Um, instead of smaller studies uh, and it does show that there is improved physical function and there is a bit of variable effect they said on sort of psychological function and quality of life but there's definitely no harms demonstrated which is generally a fear of a lot of people with sort of chronic pain that if they exercise that it will it will cause more harm it doesn't um, um, so an acupuncture I picked that out as a sort of a, as, a, as a type of sort of treatment, and it is useful for chronic low back pain. There's two studies uh, there, and likewise with sort of headaches and migraines, it's useful for that. Would point out though that actually acupuncture for low back uh, for acute low back pain, there's very little data to support that that's very as effective. Um, also, another condition, irritable bowel syndrome. That's what IBS stands for. Um, sort of studies going back to sort of 1984, um, uh, there is sort of a, a, a specialist um, in the north of England who was doing hypnotherapy for people with really uncontrollable IBS pains. Um, um, it wasn't effective for everyone, nothing ever is, uh, but, um, um, but this showed sort of enduring positive benefits on of mind focus and hypnotherapy focused on uh, the, the gut and ways of thinking about, you know, um, uh, flow through the gut and techniques through that, but um, uh, in a hypno hypnotic uh, therapy. 
So I think I've demonstrated that you know, there is a traditional sort of way of managing pain, but actually this is probably not really up to date. We should be looking at sort of um, uh, assessing somebody. Somebody needs to make an assessment and a diagnosis of your pain, otherwise you don't know what you're treating. Therefore, you, you, that enables you to understand what's causing your pain. So if it's osteoarthritis or if it's you know, psoriatic arthritis or if it's sort of sciatica, you can modify uh, the different sorts of treatments that's available. And understanding it is really important. I give an example of myself. I had back pain a while ago. I occasionally still get back pain. Occasionally I felt as though it's been sciatica. And when I've been in the patient's sort of position on a couch getting examined, from my medical knowledge, I realised actually it's not sciatica. It is mechanical back pain, which actually relieved me somewhat, which was helpful. Um, also, the other thing is chronic pain. It's really important to think about the impact of chronic pain. So this is where maybe other um, resources you might potentially need to sort of think about help from other people, etc. Um, and individualising sort of what um, your uh, uh, pain and diagnosis is really important, as we've seen here, that there are so many different sort of causes of pain and treatments of pain, and not. All um, not all of them is actually right for you um, and obviously there is the if we look at the uh, sort of a, a something called the biopsychosocial model of sort of um, assessment of chronic pain this fits in with this um, so it, it is more than just about uh, a diagnosis and a cure um, so we've got a huge load of sort of uh, therapies available here. Unfortunately, that's not come out sort of very well there, but um, you, you'll be able to see this on the sort of website. And um, this is why one of the reasons why we sort of offer so many different sort of treatments here, because uh, they all work for sort of different sort of things. So I'm going to hand over to Liz. Um, thank you very much. Okay. I'm going to do one thing first. Yep. forward back. <laughs> thank you, Francis, And thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, if anybody would like to stand up, sit down, if they feel like they need to shake around, please feel free. And is anybody needing seats to come in? Everybody okay? Yeah. Okay, great. My name is Liz Lanifer Evans, and I'm an acupuncturist and I'm a Chinese medicine herbalist. Um, one of the things I'm going to go into immediately is the fact that um, what I particularly do, what I always say, is Chinese medicine. And Chinese medicine is actually an umbrella term for several different things. So when we look at treatment, um, we look at acupuncture, we look at herbs. Um, and acupuncture also includes things like uh, electroacupuncture, where you actually put little electrodes, which isn't nearly as frightening as that sounds. It, it just creates a little bit more stimulation. It's used in a lot of the studies when they do um, research on pain, uh, just because it actually works really well. Uh, but also cupping. There's something called gua sha, which we actually use a spoon, and it's a skin scraping, which is uh, goes back into the, the, the times of almost folk medicine, but it's actually really effective. Um, and we also use moxibustion, which is um, a herb, which they, they floss, and it ends up being used, creates heat, and we'll talk about uh, why that's important. Um, as a herbalist, um, in China they use a number of things, they use animals, minerals and plants, but in the UK we only use plants because that's how it's defined as herbalism. So that's what we legally use. But also under Chinese medicine is <coughs> diet and nutrition, um, meditation, and also exercise. And Francis mentioned uh, Tai Chi, <coughs> so Tai Chi and Qigong as a form of exercise. Um, and when, so what I'd like to do is introduce a little bit of that theory because what I'd like you to do is go away with some ideas and maybe think about pain in a little bit of a different way in ways that you might be able to help yourself today. Okay? So the first concept, um, no matter what modality is using, whether you're doing Qigong, whether you're doing acupuncture, if there is free flow, there is no pain. If there's pain, there is no free flow. So that's ultimately what we're looking looking at. The idea is that 
if your energy, if the flow stagnates, you have a bit of pain. And typically that's kind of more of an aching pain. It can also show up in different areas. But if it goes to the point where instead of stagnating, like a traffic jam, instead of just slow traffic, it stops, that's a different kind of pain. And that will show up in things like very pinpoint pain, stabbing, um, uh, and much more severe. So that's what we're ultimately trying to do is just move. So typically, when we talk about acupuncture, or in Chinese medicine, the theories are all the same. We look at the 12 meridians. Um, the 12 meridians, they are uh, run up and down the body. You get uh, three coming down from the arm body on the outside, three from the outside. Same thing with the legs, making to 12. And they're associated with organs. Um, and in fact, they're usually referred to as organ theory, is kind of. And it's just one of um, several different theories. But this is the main theory that when you're in the West, people use. It's a bit of a standardized version. So um, if you take a look at Chinese medicine uh, theories over thousands and thousands of years, there were many different kinds. And it changed based on um, wars, um, whether they were dominated. For example, at one point, uh, the Chinese were uh, dominated by um, Mongolia. And all type of Chinese medicine went underground. But research was considered a way that you could kind of continue to do things. So they got, did really good at research. At one point, they had decades and decades and decades of war. And they got really good at orthopedics. They got really good at fixing bones and doing wounds. And so it's changed and evolved. The Taoists had a different perspective than the Confucianists. So it's all very different. But what came out and what we do in the West is a bit of a standardized version. Um, it's on the points, as, as the meridians, there are specific points, and those are the needling points, and those are the things that we look for. And we typically look for pain that would be among those, uh, along those meridians, and we would move that. But when we also, when you take a look at research, and, and um, Francis was taking a look at um, uh, some of the research that was done, and there's a lot of challenges in research. I won't go into that. It's a whole different thing. And might even, I don't know if you're bringing that up in the placebo talk, but there's a whole element on why, you can probably imagine why doing a double-blind study where me as a practitioner and a patient wouldn't know if a needle is going in. There's a whole, you know, to do a pro what is considered a gold standard study. There's a lot of challenges around that. So these, as I said, are the kind of the point specific. Um, and within these 12 meridians, the reason why the standard version um, was passed on is because they chose really good points. Um, they're very powerful points. Um, and basically, it kind of caught on as, as, as a, a good method to use. So from a Chinese medicine perspective, the main causes of pain are actually managed many. They talk about first of exogenous factors. These are climactic factors. And I've only, there's actually five, but I've only put three on for, for time's sake. These are the main ones, especially in, funny enough, in Britain, <laughs> the ones we get, wind, wind cold, damp. Um, now, one of the things to keep in mind, sometimes this is literally about climate, and sometimes it's a metaphor. And the Chinese are really, really good at kind of mixing those, where sometimes you don't really quite know whether they're really talking about cold or whether they're talking about the metaphor of cold. Um, and um, th th so anyway, move on to that. So things like wind. Um, from the metaphor aspect, they would say wind is something because wind blows the trees, so it's more upper body. Um, wind moves, it's migratory. Um, and, but this is the type of thing that you would get. Uh, it's also no fixed location. So a lot of times somebody will come in with really bad shoulder pain and then you say, well, where is it? And they go, well, it, it's kind of here. But then actually sometimes it's down here. Well, actually this morning it went, it's that kind of thing. Um, and when we talk about cold, that is a little bit more fixed. And cold, if you think about what cold is, if you go to the cold, you contract. And so it's a more of a contracting, stagnating pain. Um, a lot of times you get um, a limited movement. So within cold, a lot of times if somebody's, um, if they get a neck crick and they come in like this and they go, that's, that would be one of the things of kind of looking at cold. And damp um, is exactly what it sounds like. It's just that heaviness. So when people talk about uh, people who have chronic fatigue or ME and they talk about heaviness, that's damp. 
Now, the reason I'm a little bit vague on how to even talk about them is because they always come together. Most of these things, you usually don't get somebody who just has damp or just has wind. They have a combination of these things. And so really, it's about deciding which one is the most, um, the bigger factor. Emotional factors come in um, as very important within Chinese medicine. And, and it's really also interesting to take a look at what emotional factors, because um, the Yellow Emperor's Classic, which is one of the main books that are used within Chinese medicine, um, they say, the, the quote they say is, anger causes the qi to rise, joy causes it to move slowly, grief drastically consumes it, fear causes it to decline, fright causes it to be deranged, and worry causes it to stagnate. And um, interestingly, Confucius had love and desire in there, as did uh, Lao Tzu of, uh, of one of the, the Taoist master, and other people had other ones like pensiveness and shock. Overall, what you're looking at, if you notice joy and love, you think, joy? I can't be happy. And, um, but I think what they're talking about, and there's been a lot of different dialogue about what it meant, why, why would joy be in there? And really what they're talking about is too much stimulation. And, and if you think about um, all that we come in, 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 in these days, we're constantly stimulated. We're looking to be stimulated. If you take a look at the news, they're trying to stimulate you. And what they, take, what they look at in Chinese medicine is one of the metaphors, which I think is quite beautiful, is that our nature is like a pond. And the top of the pond is very, very clear water. But at the very bottom, it's muddied. And if you are emotionally stimulated, the water starts moving. And then the, the mud from the top enclouds your nature. And, um, and from the Taoist perspective, they take a look at um, that one of the purposes of life, one of the values of life, that what we look for to be happy um, is to learn about ourselves and to have meaningful interaction. And meaningful interaction is with people but meaningful interaction is also with ourselves and how we learn things. But it's very individual. And, um, and it's not based on what others think and are telling you how you should be. And we get a lot of that, how you should be, what is right, what is wrong. Um, but um, it's our individual take. So when we take a look at something and something upsets us or bothers us, what does that mean to me? And that's from a Taoist perspective, uh, perspective that's what's valuable. One of the other aspects, food, and this is really important. Um, but I want to talk about it a little bit of a different way because there's a whole bunch of information about food in general. We have um, lots of different things. There's always something going on about what is good for you and what isn't good for you. <coughs> and um, from the Chinese <coughs> medicine perspective, they have just as many arguments about what is good for you and what is. Typically, I would say the one thing I think is really quite good is they do say that um, in cold season, not to eat cold foods. And um, personally, I really find that if you listen to your body, your body knows exactly what it wants. Because a lot of times when it comes to winter, people find that they're going to be choking down that salad. And when they really want to have is some soup. And I think that if you look at the climate and you look at um, what you feel, what, what sounds good, what looks good, a lot of times if you really listen, your body's pretty good at it. I do find that this book is one of my favorite books. It's not at all Chinese medicine. Uh, but Michael Pollan in Defense of Food. And what I really like about this book is that he talks about um, the politics of food. And so you can kind of start deciphering what is good. And ultimately, his final thing is eat food. And when he says eat food, it means real food. So <coughs> he basically says processed food is bad. Not too much, because overeating is not a very good thing to do, um, and mostly vegetables. And with all the research he did, that's what he came up with. And, but it really does sort it out. It's quite an amazing book. I really enjoy it. Um, another book, and the, what I like about this one, this is actually um, Peter Dedman, who's actually a, a Brightonian, uh, Live Well and Live Long. And what I like about this particular book is he writes a lot about how you eat. And this is very much Chinese medicine. And the value of how you eat is never really discussed. But um, it's quite important, and I always kind of love, there was a study that they did um, where they showed a cake, and they showed a bunch of Americans the cake, and they said, um, what, are your, what are your first, thought, first thoughts on this? And everybody went, oh, um, gluttony, fat, um, you know, diet, these are all the things, feeling guilty, shame, all this stuff. 
and they showed it to French people, this cake, and they went, celebration, birthday, happiness. And I think, and if you think about it, again, this will go into the placebo talk of your perspective and your thoughts based on what you eat. If you're sitting there thinking, A, I don't like what I'm eating, or B, I shouldn't be eating this, your body is not going to like that. So I think um, learning how to enjoy your food, uh, being hungry when you eat, so not eating too much. So the next meal you go to, you're actually hungry. Um, not over sitting while you eat. Those are actually really, really important things. And within the reason food is important in Chinese medicine is because the food you take in creates energy. And remember, all of this is about free flow of energy. And you have to have energy for it to move. And so if you have food, if you have good food, that when you eat it, and you enjoy it, and you eat it slowly, and you're sitting down, and your body takes that, it's going to create energy for you. The other thing we look at is stress. Now, we, everybody kind of knows stress is not necessarily a good thing, so I'm not going to dwell too much on that. But interesting, again, this is what Live Well and, long, uh, uh, Live well and Live Long talks about, is too much exercise and lack of exercise. Now, we all know lack of exercise. Francis mentioned this about the fact of the importance of exercise. But there's also something about too much exercise. And usually this is something a little bit more 30 plus, 40 plus. But a lot of times, um, people are expending themselves too much. They're going, you know, they come and they're absolutely exhausted. And they go, I'm really exhausted. And I did my 10 mile run. <laughs> and you kind of go, how did you feel after that 10 mile run? I was exhausted. Maybe not do a 10 <coughs> mile run. Maybe do a five mile run. Um, it's that kind of thing. But also really the value is when you talk about things like the breath exercises. Um, especially when you're getting older, because the exercise you do should not be expending energy. You don't have that as much energy when you're older as you need to nurture yourself. You need to create energy. And that's the breath exercises. That's through your yoga. That's through Tai Chi. That's through Things that when you're doing the move, you're connecting with the breath. And that creates energy. Traumatic injuries, now this is the one thing that is if you have a traumatic in injury, and traumatic injury also includes surgery, that although you obviously can't go, well, I, well, you can prevent traumatic injuries if you're very, very careful in life. But um, although the other ones are the main causes of pain, um, even though you get a traumatic injury, you can utilize the others to help in your own treatment. So just because it happens doesn't mean you, you can't do anything about it. Um, helping with your diet, helping um, reduce stress, uh, doing exercise. Um, can also help. Okay, the next thing I'm going to go into is a little bit um, of a different pattern. I mentioned about the 12 meridians, and this is normally what people do. Um, the 12 meridians aren't the only meridians in the body. Most people, when they think of acupuncture, that's all they think about. But there's actually several different other meridians. There's something called the Luo, there's the Divergent Channel, there's the Eight Extraordinary Channels, and the Sinu meridians aren't really used in the West. They were dropped off thousands of years ago, mainly because if you notice um, the pathways, this is just from the leg channels, okay, so there's obviously, there, there's um, nine others, but as they're long and extended on the body, when we look for things, we actually palpate them, and there's obviously, there were times within um, dynasties within, within uh, China where it would be considered rude to palpate some of these. Now, obviously, some of these we would be more careful on others on certain areas, but um, as you're palpating, they just would never palpate a woman down her side. So they, you know, it just kind of got left off. But what I'm going to introduce about this, what I find really fascinating, is um, there's a Taoist tradition that uses the Sinu meridians quite a bit. And what's really interesting about the Taoist medicine is the way it gets passed on. It's not through books, it's all through oral tradition. So this is why it never really reached the West. But recently, there was a man, Jeffrey Huen, who um, has been giving lectures. He's actually a New Yorker, so I love getting, hearing a, a, a Taoist priest of um, uh, two different lineages of, of um, uh, almost 100 years speaking in a New York accent. So it's <laughs> quite lovely. So, um, but one of the aspects they talk about this, um, and you'll see where I'm coming from, is the first meridian is actually called the bladder meridian. And it starts up from the eyes, comes back down, and you can see there's straps that come around forward um, into the chest area and come along the back, down the gluteus, 
down the hamstrings, into the calf, into the foot. And the idea between this is the, from the Taoist pr perspective, these are the muscles that you would use in order to get up from a chair, okay? You'd first go, okay, need to look where I'm going, using the eyes, extend the head back, and then use those muscles to get up. And from the Taoist perspective, every time you are thinking of what you need to do next, you're sitting in a chair and you're thinking, you're not even gonna get up, you're just sitting there and you think, oh God, I gotta go, you know, gotta go to Sainsbury's. All the muscles along that sinew meridian fire. They tense, they contract. Without you even knowing it, it's just in, it, it, it's in your body, that's what's happening. So if you think about what's happening in our lives, where we're constantly thinking, we're constantly out of the moment, thinking, what do I need to do next? that muscle could potentially be in constant contraction. You could end up with back pain. You could end up with headaches, shoulder pain, and not even know why. And one of the things they also talk about is the fact that you can get them released. You can say, fine, I'm gonna go get a massage. I'm so tense. Lie down, get the massage, release, you get up, you say, I feel great. And you walk out and go, oh gosh, with those things I have to do, fire, fire, fire. So you might feel good for a couple of days, but after a while, you have to release it. And so from the perspective they're looking at is you need to be aware of where you hold your tension. And what's one of the, the, the valuable things, the reason why Tai Chi and Qigong is so good is part of it is about the breath, but it's about the movement, extending, creating movement. But one of the things they frequently do is think about where was I holding tension? How do I feel now that I've done Tai Chi, Qigong? Where have I released tension? Now for some people they'll say, well, wait a minute, I don't have back pain. I had a traumatic injury. Um, you know, I, I, it doesn't apply to me, but it can exasperate other conditions. So just keep that in mind that it, we're, we, we are all holding tension in certain areas. If you consider the middle meridian, it's the stomach meridian, and where that's looking at is actually as you're moving through life. And you're moving through life and all of a sudden you get stopped. And there's like a bam, and you're stopped. And if you think about what happens if somebody stops you you contract, you contract your stomach muscles, you actually contract your chest, you contract, you clench your hands, sometimes you even clench your eyes. And from that perspective, there are, from the Taoist perspective, they say that if you're moving through life and you're actually not engaged with, the, with what you're wanting to do, you're not moving forward, you feel like you're constantly being stopped, or you have disappointment. You wanted, um, you were told you're gonna get a promotion, you didn't get it, and you constantly feel disappointed that contraction, you end up carrying it. And if you think about what that position is, slightly bending the knees, you walk differently, you actually walk gripping with the, the, the middle three toes as you walk, and it creates almost a depressive type of, of, of carriage in your body. And again, it's about realizing that, understanding where you have your holding patterns, where um, you're creating tension in your own body. And the last one is along the side, and it's the gallbladder meridian. And very quickly, what um, ultimately, you, you kind of know if you have that pattern, if you ever look in the mirror and you look and you kind of go, one of my shoulders is wonky. That's gallbladder. And usually those are things where if you have pain that's on a rotation, okay, you actually end up holding on one side. Um, and don't underestimate this. I was, um, one of the things that I do is I, I, I ride horses and we have this whole thing about in the dressage world where you have to sit straight on your horse because if you're asking your horse to move sideways you have to be even on the horse otherwise it's very difficult for them to do that and I was one that went through all the same years I've been working on the fact I've been sitting crooked on my horse and I went to it's actually a mechanical horse so it actually measures exactly how you're doing so I'm gonna lock this in and I found out actually that if I sat on this mechanical horse and I put my legs out like this I sat perfectly but I put my legs on and I went like that. And I realized I was gripping with my right hip flexor. And I thought, I don't grip with my, I can do yoga, I can stretch, I can sit in a lotus, I'm fine. Next day I'm sitting and doing some meditation, I realize I'm gripping with my right hip flexor all the time. I have no idea. It's constantly like this. And so the next time I got on my horse, I sat there and I just literally just kind of like, like a chicken with my knees went like this. And it just ached because it did not want to give. It did not want to give. 
But the point is, here I am doing, you know, I was doing, I've been doing the yoga, I've been doing them, and had no clue. So the idea is that if you really have to focus, it really takes a strong focus. Um, and, and that's where I think things like I said, like Qigong and Tai Chi are really, really good because they um, can help you learn a little bit about the body and where you are holding patterns. So I've just moved on. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so although the causes, I mean, keep in mind that several of those things may or may not pertain. They can be <coughs> complex. When I talked about things like um, stagnation, where things are slow, acupuncture is great for that. Typically, if they get to the point of stabbing pain, depending on where they are, sometimes I add in herbs. But do consider things about how food, how exercise, how your emotional in, uh, state might impact, your, uh, might impact your life and your health. So, with Francis back, or myself, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's a question for you, I suppose, but yeah. um, it sounds, the impression I'm getting is that most of your practice is to do with chronic pain. I would say the majority of the stuff we get is chronic pain. Yeah. yeah. So um, how would you uh, relate the techniques that you've been talking about to acute pain? I mean, if I did my knee in and came in the next day, um, you know, traditionally you might get ibuprofen or something like that. Mm -hmm. What would your take on it be? The cause is very clear. I've twisted my knee. The pain is acute. What sort of techniques would you use? We basically use meridian techniques. And ultimately, the same, there's the same type of aspect, which is if you have pain, if you keep things moving. And I have treated actually a lot of people with things like um, a sprained ankle, they were doing a marathon. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, your body still has to heal. Mm -hmm. So all you're really looking at is possibly making it um, a little bit, you do want a certain amount of pain mm -hmm. because you want to protect it. So it's not gonna be something that's going to be, um, you know, you're not gonna walk out and go, oh, I have no sprained ankle. Yeah. Your, your ankle yeah, has yeah, to heal. Okay. But sometimes what it'll do is just um, helps to help stimulate the healing um, and, um, and and reduce the pain a bit to make it a little more tolerable. And really in situations that, like that, what you're looking to do, in my perspective, is sleep well. Yeah. Um, because really when you have pain at night and you're not sleeping, you're, um, you're not healing. And in, med and in medicine, I would say there are some elements that we know about in acute pain and that healing and inflammatory process can be harmful. And sometimes when that gets out of balance, and that can then cause problems potentially. So there is some evidence about that. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions? Um, the, uh, who's the author of the book? Like, Peter Dedman. Um, was a bit blurred. Yes. You know, it's one of the. <laughs> you can't tell until it's up there. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Yes. I'm not quite sure how to word this. Like, I've got chronic pain, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, mm. all the time. And it's like the kind of the regulator switch, or the on-off switch, or the volume switch. Pain is turned on to full volume constantly. Mm. And it feels like it's not relevant. You know, there's been lots of injuries. They, they're healed, mm. so it's like there's some signals going at 24 hours a day, you know, yeah. screaming pain. Mm. Um, like, so is that the, from the body, is that the mind, and how do you turn that switch? Okay, so I think from the research we do know about with sort of there are people who have chronic pain have sort of persistent changes in the brain, so those persistent changes in the brain can then affect certain areas which sort of um, deal with sort of drives and sort of impulses and sort of um, um, learning, things like memory, um, other aspects which are, are more complicated. I and mean, we actually don't really know much necessarily about actually how the brain actually sort of um, um, works um, at a bigger sort of detail but actually some nerves themselves we do know sort of a lot about individual nerves and how they work but the the, the sort of the research into sort of why things are happening um, it, there, there is still a lot of sort of a lot of stuff that we don't know but I think it's um, 
we it, it is very clear that there is sort of a mind and body sort of connection there and I'm sort of uh, going back to my sort of talk the whole idea of sort of um, a, a, a two-part approach saying there is mind and body uh, just doesn't work and actually there's um, uh, so we sort of integrate some of them both together but we are finding that sort of you know the brain is an organ the same as anywhere else it does have changes in response to pain and then in itself it's you know, I use the term sort of black box of pain. The brain is a bit of a black box sort of um, in itself. We don't quite know what's sort of going on in there. Um, and, um, you know, and, and, and people's individual responses to pain and what causes them to have pain uh, is very particular to them. So this is why going back to getting a diagnosis and sort of a set of assessment and diagnosis and individualising sort of your... Um, management or anybody with chronic pain is really important because then it can tease out the, 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 sort of the, the details, the sort of jigsaw puzzle of why you might have pain. Um, most doctors kind of just offer you drugs and mm, drugs don't work. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and in fact, it's because more <coughs> people are suffering from symptoms. Yeah. And they've got side effects yeah, and uh, uh, another sort of longer term effects potentially as well. So. I think this is where maybe transitioning from acute pain, you know, asked about sort of earlier sort of to, to chronic pain, we have to move away from using pills and those sort of things to other ways of sort of managing pain um, and actually using the brain as a, um, and the mind itself as a sort of a, as a uh, you know, a, a, as a sort of therapeutic option as well. So, and that actually links into, I don't know if you'll come into the talk tomorrow about placebo effect. And actually, there's a lot of research into um, actually the, the placebo effect and, it's, and it is an effect. I mean, it's not called, called placebo on its own, it is an effect. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Marshall Andrews tomorrow is going to be talking about that. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure whether that answers your question as much as maybe you might expect it, but uh, it's a of an idea. I think it's ways of thinking about pain and what it means and um, yeah. What I, what I heard was like saying phantom limb pain. Mm. You know, that I mean, you don't have a foot but mm. you're getting pain in yeah. your foot. That it comes from like the central central nervous system or the yes. spinal column something like that. But that's where all the signals go to that then go to the brain. Yeah. So if your foot isn't chopped off, the signal is mm. it's not coming from your foot, it's mm. coming from your central so, yeah, so it's all column, that's right. through the sort of spinal column and in the brain. Because the brain, you know, once your leg's chopped off, your bit of your brain sort of doesn't get cut out in the sense of sort of like you're losing that area and your uh, you say that the, the limb that's been cut out, it's still there. The brain still thinks it's there. Um, but the, the details about sort of how that develops sort of pain is a little bit unclear, but uh, um, so that's why it's sort of that type of pain, phantom limb pain, is maybe sort of different than other types of sort of types of chronic pain. So that's why it's important to try and work out, you know, what type of pain you might have. So do doctors or people, mm. like, do you go with that uh, understanding that, it, that it's all in the spinal column or not? It's would be through the central nervous system so the, and the brain is part of the central nervous system um, and obviously the brain and how that connects into how we think and behave and that connection and um, what makes us how an individual that's a big another area of discussion beyond what I can do as a general practitioner um, but yeah there is a um, in Chinese medicine there's a it's newer it was developed um, in, in the 1900s, but it's scalp acupuncture, and it's based on the brain. Um, and um, in fact, I've used it to treat phantom limb syndrome successfully. Um, so there's aspects of that. If you ever want to Google scalp acupuncture and, and your condition, scalp, scalp acupuncture. Yes, yeah, the needles in the in the scalp. But it's um, quite an interesting one. If that's okay. Question. Um, yeah. I've got loads to say, so I'll try and not take up too okay. much time. So bear with me. Um, and I just wanted to respond to you quickly. It's interesting that you talk about the dial of pain on the top of volume, and there is absolutely, you know, a whole swathe of research that's been done in the last ten years 
about what pain is. Mm -hmm. So we're learning more and more and more all the time. And there are absolutely specialists that understand the connection uh, with the nervous system. And I, I'm a little bit disappointed that we didn't get to talk about the nervous system a little bit more, but obviously this is an overarching talk for, for people. And the, the dial can go up and the dial can go down. It is different for different people, and there's lots of different ways of approaching it. And it is about that experience of pain. Pain isn't just a neural signal. It's an experience that's generated in the brain, which is part of the nervous system. And it's to do with how we perceive quite a lot of different things that go on at once. And it's very difficult to tackle that all at once. But you can start to reassure and down-regulate that dial. It's a bit like an alarm system. If you have something bad happen at your house, you're going to turn the sensitivity on the alarm. And then any cat walking past or any leaves blowing into the garden triggers that alarm system. Whereas you can teach the alarm system very slowly, in a lot of cases, just reduce that sensitivity. And there's a lot of work being done about that. Because um, some of that comes from a body memory rather than the mind. And interesting, we talked about phantom limb pain. I was reading there's an amazing book. It's not cheap. It's called Explain Pain. And it's by a chap called Lauren Mosley, who works out at the University of New South Wales, and a group called Noi Group, N-O-I, so about nose deception. And they're doing, they're literally one of the best resources I've ever come across on pain. They're doing absolutely sterling work. And um, where you mentioned that actually pain management and pain education is one of the things that people find, amongst other things, can help to reduce the pain experience. So often the more we know about it, it's reassuring because the fear, the avoidance, all of that complex set of, of how our thoughts and our actions play into it. But just phantom limb pain. In this book they mentioned that it's not even just in amputee, it's also found in individuals that have been born with limbs missing. So it's the body map that's genetic. So it really is quite a nuance and quite a um, you know, complex thing, but that doesn't mean it's undoable. And actually having faith that you can get there is a really big part of it as well, and that's also very helpful. And I think just following on to that, you're sort of about modifying pain. I mean, looking at sort of this gate model, gatekeeper model of sort of pain, which where ner other nerves can switch off or on sort of pain nerves would fit in with that idea that you know, there are other factors that can modify that through sort of things like endorphins um, and, um, you know, obviously a lot of research on all of that as well as the endocannabinoid sort of and, you know, using sort of the medical equivalents of that um, as well. So I think sort of, um, um, so, yeah, so these sort of do seem to connect up that things can be modified. What's the med medical equipment of endocannabinoids? Uh, endocannabinoids, so that would be cannabis, um, so medical What's cannabis. CBD? CBD oil. So CBD so oil is... You, can't, you, can't, you don't get that at a doctor's. The no. research isn't clear on that mm. yet. It's not, but I think there's sort of, uh, so CBD oil, so cannabidiol oil is a, considered a, a nutritional supplement because it has less than, I think it's 0.03% of the, uh, the chemical that makes you high, which is uh, THC. So a that's lot of conditions actually need that. Medicine so, yes. Cancers, you need high yeah. of yeah. THC and the... Yeah, and I think there's, there are some medicines out there which were, are, you know, cannabis, and actually from the 1st of November, Medical cannabis is available to prescribe. GPs cannot prescribe it. It has to be through a specialist and it has to be through um, sort of for specific conditions. But I think there's a lot of research into the details about why there is a difference between medical cannabis and cannabidiols as well. So, um, it's got all chemicals out that's not mm. natural and that's mm. not organic, it's not having the right amount of the chemicals that are making That's why. Okay, and I'd like to just whilst we've sort of coming towards the end of the talk, so if anybody else wants to sort of ask any questions, we've got about another minute or so for either myself or Liz. So there's a question back here in the reception area. I've got impeachment on my neck and my shoulder and my night time. I can't just sleep on my neck. Oh, okay. Unfortunately, I can't make individual advice in a meeting room uh, here, unfortunately, so I think it would be a good idea to make an appointment with you all. GP practice, if you're registered here, be with us, uh, or your other, your GP, um, who make an assessment and sort of try to manage your pain. Um, anybody else? I was just 
Yeah. I've been treated here for pain, um, mm. and um, to break the cycle that I don't move enough, mm. and because I don't move enough, I'm, I'm more likely to get pain mm. from arthritis than mm. being crazy. And so I've meant uh, quite high levels of pain for those mm. short periods, mm. and obviously that's got to be very careful and careful because of all the side effects mm. you know, the stomach and things. And I was wondering, is that where Chinese medicine could come in, mm. or acupuncture? Is be as, as a sort of substitute for painkillers mm. without those side effects? Yeah. I, I would say, um, depending also, the, the, the mm. it could also reduce the painkillers. Ultimately, um, it'd be great to get as substitute, but a lot of times it's a step-down thing. So yeah. what we're looking at, and sometimes what we'll get is somebody will have acupuncture and they'll say, I don't feel I'm any better. And then you say, have you reduced your meds? And they said, yeah, by half. And I'm sleeping well. So you kind of go, okay, well, I know, it's very subtle. Don't yeah. realize it. It's no, like absolutely. To someone really, you know, something makes you say, you're walking better or you're sleeping mm. better. Mm. It's not some you know, yeah. big wham. It's, yeah. you know, it's the nature of pain, isn't it? Yeah. So it's that's really hard yeah, to Yeah, the sort of functional element that we sort of fu you know, talk about as well when we're trying to manage pain. Yeah. All right, well, I think we're going to have to wind things up. Um, thank you very much thank for you. coming. Thank you. Thank you.